They do that in all the action movies. Okay, welcome. Uh, my name is Tom Zimmerman. I'm the chair of ACM 6 Soft, and I'm here to present the ACM 6 Soft Outstanding Research Award. Um, first, first, let me say a few things about uh, Six Soft, the ACM Special Interest Group on Software Engineering. The mission of SIGSOFT is to improve our ability to engineer software by stimulating interaction among practitioners, um, researchers, and educators. Um, for, and for example, like we have at conferences like this, um, like ICSI. So SIGSOFT is organizing several conferences. Um, and the mission of Sorry, excuse me. And the, the other goal of, of SIGSOFT is to foster the professional development of software engineers and also to represent software engineers to professional, legal, and political entities. Um, and as part of the SIGSOFT mission, SIGSOFT is also organizing an annual award program, which Uh, includes the SIGSOFT Outstanding Research Award. And this award is presented to an individual or individuals who have made significant and lasting research contributions to the theory or practice of soft engineering. And at this point, I'd like to thank all the nominators, endorsers, and also the 2021 award committee, which consisted of Marsha Chechik, Mark Harmon, Cheng Cleland Huang, and Max Dipenta for, for all the amazing work they did in, in recommending talented, outstanding researchers and also making the final selection. And I'm happy to announce that the 2021 Outstanding Research Award goes to Brehm Devanbu for profoundly changing the way researchers think about software by exploring connections between source code and natural language. So who is Prem Devanbo? He is uh, at University of California at Davis, and he just recently got promoted to Distinguished Professor, Effective July. And he is one of the pioneers of using software data to help improve software tools and practices. And just for background, over the past decade, open source projects have become really popular and been widely adopted. And as a result, there's a lot of data about the interactions in open source repositories. And um, this includes version control systems, bug databases, and also the so social interactions. And these have been used by uh, many researchers to support software developers. And Dr. Devambu has made a series of really foundational contributions to the use of big data and software engineering. And many of his contributions actually received most influential paper awards at conferences. And here you can see some of the pictures of the awards that he won over the past few years. And some of his contributions are, for example, techniques for mining social networks from email archives which was most influential paper of MSR 2006, data quality issues in Git repositories, most influential paper at MSR 2009, latent self-organizing social structures in open source projects, most influential paper at FSE 2008, bias and its effects in defect data, most influential paper award at ESEC FSE 2009, and the quality risks of minor contributions in software projects. And this was actually one of the most influential papers in the 30-year history of the ISRI conference. And more recently, Dr. Devambu introduced the idea of naturalness, which is basically the idea that source code is highly repetitive and predictable, even more so than natural language. And this property has, can actually be used to model and exploit, uh, can be modeled and exploited using approaches from statistical NLP and machine learning. And this has led to 
a very active research area with hundreds of papers being published at all the top soft engineering conferences, many dedicated workshops, and also multiple startups just focused on this idea and active groups in all the major companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and many more. And today, Dr. Devan Bu will actually give a keynote on this topic and share his perspective on research and also a lot of soft engineering history. I would also like to add that uh, Dr. Devambu is, uh, has been recognized as an ACM fellow, and he's also a very passionate attendee and also organizer of the top soft engineering conferences. And I would li now like to stop sharing my slides and congratulate uh, Dr. Devambu on, on his accomplishments and this award and give him a chance to say a few words. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. I uh, appreciate the committee um, and, and, the, uh, and the nominators and the others for, for this award. Um, I'm extremely honored. I would say this is the honor of my lifetime. Uh, I'm, I'm most grateful also to the ICPC chairs for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, thank you so much. I'll have more to say about all the different people that were involved in this work uh, during my talk. So uh, I'll stop for now. Okay, so, so we have a few more minutes to till the official start time of the keynote. Um, I wanna say, uh, just say that also Dr. Devambu will be available for a meet, uh, meet and greet, or like you can meet him virtually in person after the keynote session. And you can actually meet him in both uh, bands. You can meet him in the live stream, uh, but also in the mirror session in the evening today. So please stick around and ask him a few amazing questions. Um, I can, just to give you some idea of what you can ask, I'm actually gonna ask him um, a, to share his favorite XE memory because it's all virtual, so we wanna know what what his experience has been at physical conferences. Um, let's see. Um, I guess my favorite ICSI memory was ICSI 1994. Uh, this was the night before my talk. I was staying in a hotel in Italy, and there was a whole mess of, I think, British tourists uh, outside the window of my hotel um, who were singing O Sole Mio. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I basically couldn't sleep most of the night because it seemed like they were going on until three or four in the morning. And the next day I had to give my talk. And of course, you know, um, it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you sing your talk or did you give it like? Oh, no, <laughs> I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't sing my talk. You know, although, you know, I, yeah, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> So, so we previously talked about programming languages. So what's your least favorite programming language and why? JavaScript. I just don't understand it. It's very confusing. <laughs> okay. And we have a few more minutes. So your favorite title of a paper that you co-authored? Uh, I guess that would have to be, um, let's see now, um, that would probably have to be Clones, what is that smell? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Like, what, one paper title I like of yours is the Plastic Surgery Hypotheses. Ah, okay. Which was at one, I think one, one of Isaac FSC conferences. And it's just, it was so surprising to me to see this type of paper title. And Yeah, that was Earl yeah. Barr. I, left he, he, I think he's the one who came up with that title. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, with that being said, so I'm gonna start um, introducing the, the yeah. So I'm gonna start the slowly the intro, official introduction. So if you want to start sharing your screen, okay. And I'm also gonna see if I can get the proper stream layout to work. Okay. So please give us one or two minutes to get everything set up for the keynote. All right, so I think that should, does that look okay? So right now I'm seeing your slides with notes. And now I'm so seeing the screen, yeah. Okay, not the, not the notes, right? 
I don't see any notes and give okay. me one give me one wait. So I'm gonna do picture in picture. And so now now everyone should see his slides and also a video of Brahm on top of his slides. I hope. So I only see the slides, but I, I assume everyone's seeing it correctly. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to the ICSI keynote by Prem Devambu. It's my pleasure to introduce him. He is the Sixsoft Outstanding Research Award winner. But before he's starting his keynote, I actually wanna give a very quick introduction, uh, like, um, and a quick intro about his bio. So Prem received his bachelor from IIT Madras and a PhD from Rutgers University under Alex Bogida. He worked for several years in industrial software development, for example, at Bell Laboratories, but also various offshots in New Jersey. Then he joined UC Davis, where he conducts teaching and uh, research in software engineering. And he is just recently got promoted to Distinguished Professor at UC Davis, Effective July. He has won several awards for his work, including multiple Best Paper Awards, Distinguished Paper Awards, Most Influential Paper Awards, and Test of Time Awards, and the Outstanding Research Award just today. Several of his papers were invited to appear in the communications of the ACM as research highlights. He has served as PC chair of ESEC FSE 2006 and ICSI 2010, and as general chair of the MSR conference 2014 and ESEC FSE 2020. He has served on the editorial boards of ACM TOSEM, IEEE TSE, the Journal of Software Evolution and Maintenance, and the MZ Journal. He also is currently on the uh, editorial board of communications of the ACM, and he's an ACM fellow. So with that, please, Prem, go ahead, and we're looking forward to your keynote. Thank you so much. Um, so as I was saying, this award is the honor of a lifetime, and I'm very grateful to the SIGSOFT Awards Committee for the generous recognition, and to the kind people who nominated me for this award, and also to the XCPC chairs for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the National Science Foundation in the US, we're taking a big risk on this particular work uh, uh, early on when we're getting started and supporting it throughout. Um, so the title of my talk is Naturalist and Bimodality of Software Science and Applications. Let's get started. So what is naturalness? Let me clarify why I use this term. The way human beings use language to talk and the way we write language have evolved naturally needs. Our argument in this work is that the way humans code has also evolved to have very similar properties. Let me, more, let me be more specific. So why are human languages the way we are? Because we humans need to communicate effectively, even if someone is making a lot of noise, or if we're distracted by danger, or by too much champagne. For this reason, natural language tends to be repetitive, predictable, and we encode information generally, generously with a lot of redundancy. This makes natural language amenable to statistical modeling. And it is this statistical modeling that enables wonderful tools like speech recognition, natural language translation, and so on. If you think about it, generating natural language is a combinatorial search over large vocabularies and complex grammars. Doing this well would be pretty much impossible without a good probabilistic model of what Spanish or English or Tamil looks like so we can sample from this model and generate better uh, better utterances. So what about code? Well, most of us think of code as being written to be executed by computers. The work done by our brothers and sisters in the PL community makes this possible. Code is written in a language that has precise formal semantics, which computers strictly follow. But we software engineers know that the most important thing about code is that it is read and maintained by other humans. And this channel of communication between humans is decidedly not formal. Unlike computers, which don't care if there's a scary tiger pacing the alleyways in a server farm, humans are not machines. 
You get distracted by noise, by angry bosses, and by other forms of entertainment. So code communicates with other humans in ways that are very different than we communicate with computers. And that's where naturalness comes from. So formal semantics are no formal semantics. The way people write code is repetitive, predictable, and amenable to statistical modeling. So consider a simple incremental operation. The computer doesn't care whether you write the increment as i equals i plus 1 or i equals 1 plus i. So that's, that's what formal semantics gets here. There are these equivalent ways of writing the same thing that really don't make any difference. But clearly, a human being would find the form on the right quite strange. Indeed, we have some experimental evidence that suggests that it's actually harder for humans to read code written in improbable ways. And they actually make more mistakes when they read code written in this way. We have a couple of papers recently in cognitive science venues um, uh, published last year that I invite you to look at. So even though code is a mathematical object with precise formal semantics, in practice, people write code in highly predictable ways. So code is natural. So is this useful? Absolutely. Naturalness helps us make better software tools, all kinds of software tools. So let me amplify upon that. So for this, let's just think about the way people normally build software tools. So usually some dev has a great idea um, about for a tool that would scratch some itch that they have. So they go ahead and build it. Um, and then once they've built the tool, they can run it over a large corpora of code and produce some kind of output. So maybe it's going to check for defects. Uh, maybe it's going to check for coding standards. Maybe it's going to produce a UML diagram. Maybe it's going to produce warnings, whatever it is, right? Excuse me. Once a developer builds the tool, they can test it and use it. Often such tools make various kinds of approximations and design trade-offs because of scale, computational complexity, and so on. These approximations and trade-offs means that in practice, the performance of these tools is not quite ideal. Sometimes they're too conservative and make a noise about things, make a lot of noise about things that don't matter. Sometimes they're too adventurous, um, uh, you know, and maybe don't do the kinds of things that you expect them to do. Um, so is there a systematic principled way to build the tool so that it's most likely to work really well on actual code? So that's where naturalness comes in. Right. So we have very large corpora of code. So these sort of billion token, multi-billion token corpora have latent within them a lot of knowledge about what code actually looks like and how to make actual tools work better on real code. Because of naturalness, what we can do is this can help our tool work better. Because we have very, very large corpora and really powerful, very high capacity models, especially with deep learning, we can make this model really good indeed. And there's a lot of ways to do this. And it seems like our, our sisters and brothers in machine learning keep coming up with new ideas on how to make these models better just about every day. I can barely keep up. So how would these probabilistic models? OK. So what might these models do? Um, so they can use probabilities for classification, right? If the probability is high enough that you know, for some code with respect to some property, we declare it to have that property, right? Uh, we can use probabilities for ranking, right? So if you wanted to produce a rank list of choices, we can use the probabilities to rank them. Um, we can use the prioritized search, right? So if the model is a sampling model, we can sample from the model in the order of probability, and maybe our search algorithms would work more efficiently. So this was the broad naturalness agenda um, you know, that we wrote about first in our paper in ICSI 2012. Um, and we've written a bunch of sort of you know, vision papers since then. There's a CACM research allies paper in 2016. And there's a, a excellent computing surveys paper in 2018 that was um, led by Milto Salamanis. So I recommend all these to you. Um, that's kind of a great way to get a vision, uh, get, get what uh, what, what the research vision of this area is. So let me just give one example to sort of illustrate this process in more detail. So this was the sort of the classic first thing we did, code suggestion. 
So the idea is to formulate the problem as a conditional distribution, right? So if you want to do code suggestion, you have some kind of context that the dev is working with in an IDE, and you want to suggest some more code that the dev could insert into her code, right? So to do this, we first develop some sort of trainable function approximator. So, um, so some function approximator to model this conditional distribution. So this could be an n-gram model. It could be some sort of deep learning network. Um, so you know whatever whatever works in this setting, right? So once we have a trainable function approximator, then we develop a training data, a loss function, um, a training algorithm, and we go ahead and train. So for example, if it's you know an n-gram model, we might use maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, if it's some sort of deep learning network, we can use SGD, um, and then so we can train this model, right? So once the model is trained, we develop some evaluation metric that is relevant to practice, that is something that actually matters to real developers, hopefully. So for example, this might be top five precision recall, might be mean reciprocal rank, uh, might be blue score, whatever, right? So you come up with some evaluation metric. And then we evaluate against the baseline, and if we're happy with it, we release the tool, and hopefully people like the tool and use it. OK, so this is sort of the general scheme. Um, and and uh, but this has turned out to be a really powerful general model, and there's lots of applications that I can briefly go over. So the simplest thing you can do, actually, and it actually works, um, is checking code, right? So if a code seems highly improbable, well, you know, it might be wrong, right? We just talked about code completion. Um, Another example is uh, name recovery. So there are various JavaScript obfuscators that take uh, informative names and replace them with uninformative names. So it turns out that you can actually recover the names using the context by learning a conditional distribution of this form. There's lots of data. You can just take plain JavaScript, obfuscate it. There's your data. So now you can try to recover names from the context. Another similar example is uh, for uh, um, gradual typing in Python and JavaScript. Um, from context, you can suggest types. Um, code patching, there's lots and lots of commits in, um, in version history that tell you how uh, code was changed, for example, to patch to fix bugs. So you can use this data to train a conditional distribution of new code given old code, sample from it, and see if you can fix bugs. Um, there's lots of comments associated with code, and you can learn a conditional distribution of English given code and use this for code summarization, um, maybe also code review. Um, you can use the same sort of pairs of data to learn a distribution in the reverse form, which to retrieve code given English. This would be code retrieval. Um, there's also lots of data on who works on what code and who comments on what code. You can use this to do a, learn a distribution of the form person given code, and maybe you can use this for task assignment or for um, code review assignment. So a lot of different possibilities, uh, quite exciting. There's been a lot of work in this area. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's around 1,000 papers, actually. Um, so lots of opportunities, lots of great work to be done. But you know, by nature, I'm a skeptic and a suspicious human being. So there are gotchas. You know, there are things to be careful about. All is not candy and roses. So I just want to talk briefly about a paper we did last year, where we explored some risks in one uh, potential risks in one application area. Right. So this is code comment synthesis. Right. So the task here is, given a method body, synthesize a descriptive comment, right? Um, to make this work, you learn, have to learn a conditional distribution of this form, right? Um, you know, uh, hopefully a sampling distribution so you can sample from this. And uh, if it's a good distribution, maybe produce good comments. So to learn a, a, a conditional distribution of this form, um, use lots of data from GitHub where you, know, you can find um, methods with preceding descriptive comments. So you can use this to learn this conditional distribution. So there's your code, and there's your comment. So using these pairs, you try and learn a conditional distribution. There's been lots of really good work, interesting work in this area, starting with Ayer et al. from 2016. They used uh, Stack Overflow. And since then, there's been a whole lot of work in this area using um, GitHub and other other sources um, is very active. In fact, this just this last week I saw some additional papers. So 
Um, so, you know, what about this work and what should we be careful about? So I refer you to our ASC paper from last year. But essentially, all this work relies on this metaphor uh, that common synthesis is like translation. So here's two flags, uh, you know, Mexico and India. So let's say you want to transit, translate from Spanish to English. That's translation. And the idea is that um, common synthesis is just like this, right? All right. So, um, so it, you know, to, to in translation, you know, you learn a conditional distribution of, for example, English given Spanish. Um, and we're trying to do essentially saying that common synthesis is the same thing. So, you know, you, you learn a conditional distribution of comments given code, just like you learn a conditional distribution of English given Spanish. So how do you learn this? Well, you have a lot of pairs of English uh, Spanish English uh, in the in the training set, and that's how you learn it. And so you have a trainable function. Uh, most people now use these sequence to sequence neural models. There are various kinds of these RNNs, transformers are all sequence to sequence models. Um, and so um, so that's what you use for translation. So why not use it for common synthesis? Um, and so for training data, you know, in translation we have a lot of Spanish English pairs, and for um, for code comment synthesis, by analogy, we have a lot of code comment pairs. So you can see the analogy is, is again maintained here. And finally, to measure the quality of a translation in natural language translation, you use blue scores. And likewise, in, um, in code comment synthesis, you also use blue scores. So we in this paper, our goal was to raise some questions about these analogies. Is common synthesis really like translation, right? So these, when we train code common synthesizers and we rely on these pairs of functions and commons, does that look like pairs of utterances in natural language? And likewise, when you do this evaluation, is this a meaningful evaluation? What are the appropriate baselines? Okay, so um, let me start with this question. Does code common data look like a well-behaved function, right? So um, what does, does it actually look like it's some function we could learn? So the reason why I ask this question is that comments tend to be very formulaic, you know, so very different functions sometimes have the comments that look very similar. So, um, so this kind of raises the question, right? Is this function when behaved? So what do I mean by that? Do similar functions have similar comments? And do dissimilar functions have dissimilar comments? Um, so when you consider English-Spanish pairs, similar English sentences will tend to produce similar Spanish sentences. And dissimilar, very dissimilar English sentences will tend to be associated with very different Spanish sentences. So what we do here is like, if we take a random pair of English sentences, if those random pair as measured by blue, blue is simply a measure of n-gram overlap. If those random pair is similar, then we can expect that the associated Spanish sentences are also similar. And if we take a random pair of English sentences and they happen to be quite dissimilar, then we would expect that the associated Spanish sentences, again, as measured by blue, are also quite dissimilar. OK, so what I'm going to show you now, I'm just warning you, it's a completely fabricated plot. I just wrote some R and made it up yesterday. There's nothing real about this, right? But it's just meant to illustrate what well-behaved data might look like. This is, you know, trust me, this is like extremely well-behaved data. So if you see this in real life, you'd be thrilled, right? So the idea is we chose a random, we have pairs of training data. We choose a random pair and we look at the similarity between the inputs as measured by blue. And then we see what the associated similarity of the output is, right? So values close to zero means that the input pairs are quite dissimilar. Values close to, sorry, quite dissimilar, yes, correct. And values close to 50, that means that the input pairs are quite similar, right? And likewise on the output. So what this plot means that if you find a plot that is quite dissimilar, that is the input code pair blue is close to zero, then the output pair blue also tends to be lower. If you randomly sample an input pair that is high similarity, that is close to 50, 50 is very high blue, um, then you tend to find that the output pair is also similar. So this is extremely 
well-behaved data. And this is what kind of we'd like to see. And this would suggest that the relationship of code to the corresponding comments is good. And this is a learnable function um, uh, you know, because, because the data is pretty well-behaved, right? So what do our code comment and natural language data sets actually look like? OK, yeah, again, I want to reemphasize this is made up data. Now I'm going to show you some real data. Right, OK, so let me start with natural language. Um, so again, this is a 2D histogram um, with the colors indicating frequency. This is German English. You know, I sa sample a random pair of German sentences and measure their similarity using input blue. And then I look at the English output and I measure the similarity between the English sentences associated with those German sentences to measure the output blue. And what this shows is that there's a fairly strong relationship, right? The more similar the inputs, that is, the higher the blue value, the more similar the outputs. And the lower this, uh, less similar the inputs, that means the lower the blue value, um, the less similar the outputs. So, <clears throat> so this, this is kind of what we would consider a well-behaved data set. And this is kind of why things like Bing Translate work so well, right? OK, so what about code? and comments, right? So this is a fairly widely used code comment data sets, right? We can easily see that input pair similarity has at best an extremely tenuous relationship. Code fragments, random code frag, pairs of code fragments that score blue, zero blue similarity, that is they're highly dissimilar, can have a quietly, quite a wide distribution of associated comment similarity. Um, so, and this lack of relationship is quite spread out over all different pairs and all different values of input similarity. Um, so, this is for DeepCom2, um, and here's another data set. This one is FunCom, and you'll see sort of the same property holds. So, what we see here is that while natural language data sets, you know, seen here on the right, this one, um, are, appear to be fairly well behaved and show some kind of functional relationship between input similarity and output similarity, the code comment pairs don't do that. So what does this mean? So similar inputs give similar outputs, but apparently mostly only for natural language translation. So the relationship of code to comments is not well behaved in code comment data sets as it is for natural language translation data sets. This, this suggests that it may be difficult to train a useful function to approximate the conditional distribution of comments given code. It doesn't mean it's impossible, it just the data suggests this may be difficult. Okay, so the current state of the art that we can see from the published papers is around 20 to 30 blue. There's, you know, there's the, another thing that we emphasize in our paper that blue can be measured in various ways. So there's considerable variability in the reported numbers. That's something that one should be cautious about. Okay, so, <clears throat> so how do we evaluate what this blue means, right? So natural language outputs are usually judged using blue, and these are essentially measures of n-gram overlap. Uh, the geometric mean of n-gram overlaps at various lengths of n-grams. So what do the state-of-the-art of numbers in the 20 to 30 range mean? So what we did in our paper is that we compared against a couple of dumb baselines. I'll, I'll go into details on one and briefly mention the other. So the one I'll mention is information retrieval, right? So the way we did it is given some code, we extract some keywords from the code. Oops, misspelling. Um, uh, and then we retrieve the most similar code using vector space methods, right? So, and then once we find the most similar code, we grab the comment associated with the most similar code and simply pretend that that is the comment that we're gonna produce from this code. And the details are again in our AAC paper. So what we find is that, you know, this uh, information retrieval approach performs at state of the art for several data sets. Um, but on the other hand, it fails terribly, catastrophically, for natural language translation. It doesn't at all work. So this gives a sense of, you know, if you just return something like, return the this of that, that actually does pretty well for a lot of methods. Um, so this suggests that new approaches may be required to push it beyond the 20 to 30 range. Um, and um, so, so that's something to think about. The other thing we found is that in many cases, if you just, if you're asked to produce a comment for a method, just grab another method in the same class and return that comment, that actually also works pretty well. So 
what we're saying here is that the code to comment relationship is not necessarily smooth, well behaved, or functional. And so, really, basic methods seem to work well, you know, well according to current state of the art. Um, so, the conclusion here is that, you know, when we apply these sort of naturalist and machine learning methods to a new problem, it's always good to examine the data to judge whether this model is suitable and what a good straw man uh, baseline might be. Okay, so, you know, although I love to be negative, uh, it's part of my nature, don't let me leave you on that note. There's actually plenty of good work to be done in this area. And as evidence, let me just list a few things that have happened. Um, I'm mostly citing our papers, but there's a lot of other work. Um, and, you know, there's just literally too much to, to cite. Uh, so language modeling for code, predicting defects, coding style and pull requests, demonifying variable names, gradual type annotations, linear parsing, which I'll say more about, program understanding, um, actually published in Cognitive Science Conference, graphical models, code patching, code summarization, very recently binary analysis. Um, there's about a thousand papers. Uh, you know, as Tom mentioned, there's groups at all the majors. There are many startups. Um, there are reported practically used in several companies. Amazon has released a product called Code Guru, which is very interesting. Um, we've recently released a virtual studio plugin to help beginners uh, fix syntax errors. Uh, I'll be saying more about that later as well. So there's lots of good stuff. Um, and you know, so don't let me leave you on a negative note. OK, so that was what I had to say about naturalness. And then let me talk about bimodality. So what is bimodality? Right, so as I mentioned earlier, code saves two purposes. It's meant for humans to control computers, and it's meant for humans to communicate computations to other human beings. The human computer channel is formal and has precisely defined semantics, right? The computer infers the meaning of a program deterministically the same way every time. On the other hand, the human-to-human -human channel is natural. The computational meaning of a, of a program is probabilistically, probabilistically inferred by a human using cues like variable names, comments, and coding styles. These things mean very little to a computer, but for a human who does probabilistic inference, trying to infer the most likely meaning, this matters a lot. OK. So um, so I've, I've shown sort of an argmax formulation here. Uh, I'm just going to try to give you a sketch of what all this is. Uh, let's explore this a bit more. So this is sort of the noisy channel model that people sample meanings from code and seems to be most likely. Um, so we can rewrite it using the standard Bayesian Nazi channel model form. And as is usual, given some code, we can eliminate it from the denominator. And so we're left with this. Right. So what we're looking at here is a process where the, re the reader samples meaning. And usually, they're going to sample this meaning from the context. So they might know what the application domain is. They might see some comments. They might know the method, method name. And from all this, they're going to sort of guess a meaning that they think is most likely. And given that meaning, they're going to look for pieces of code uh, that they think they would expect to find. right? So, um, so what is this model? Let me explain this sort of, uh, you know, all this maths in a little more detail. OK. So, so how does this, how would this actually work, right? Given some code in a context, a programmer is going to guess the meaning of what this computation might be. So maybe they're going to use the application domain. Maybe they're going to use variable names, method names. They're going to guess what the code means, right? From this guessed code, they're going to guess the most likely code elements they would expect to find in a reasonable implementation of this computation based on that experience, right? So if you think somebody is doing some sort of interest calculation because it's a financial domain, you might expect to find certain kinds of Cont, uh, cues in the code that reflect uh, the, the calculation of interest rates, right? And uh, based on this guess, you're going to match with the code that you have. And if it matches, right, so if you, the most likely meaning you guessed and the most likely implementation you guessed match, you're done. And you know everything is done the way you expect. And you can understand the code very quickly, right? Now, if that doesn't work, then maybe the next thing you do is guess Maybe they implemented it some other way. Maybe they calculated interest using logs or something unusual. So I'm going to look for that, right? And then if that matches, well, then you've got it, right? So this is a slightly less probable implementation. It takes you a little longer. 
Okay, if that doesn't work either, then you go back and resample from your distribution of what kind of computation they expect to see in this context, and you go through this process all over again. All right, so um, so this is you know may seem a little weird, but I like this model for a couple of reasons. First, it's consistent with naturalness. This kind of explains why people prefer some implementations over others. That is, i equals i plus one rather than i equals one plus i, because it makes a second stage of guessing, you know, how something might be implemented faster, right? Also, the other reason why I like this theory is that it allows us to 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 design a bunch of experiments about how code comprehension might work. And we actually done a couple of these. We hope to do a lot more. Uh, we published some papers in the CogSci conference and the CogSci journal. I know it's a little out of scope for for ICSI attendees, but you know we tried to publish in ICSI, but I think it was a better fit for the CogSci journals. Okay, so I encourage you to have a look. I think I think I think there it's it's really quite exciting and interesting stuff. Okay, so uh, so what is the hypothesis. So biomodality says um, that the code is written by humans for two purposes, to control computers and to be read by humans. The human computer channel is formal, whereas with precisely defined semantics and, and enables all kinds of algorithms like static analysis algorithms, parsing, and so on, whereas the human human channel is stochastic and probabilistic and uh, enables useful probabilistic modeling. But you knew that already, right? So what's new here? What's new here is the synergies between the algorithms and the probabilistic models. So, so what does this mean, right? So let me give some examples. First of all, we can use these algorithms to create training data for the probabilistic modeling. I'll give some examples of that. We can use, we can use the probabilistic model to drive the algorithms. For example, if you have a static analysis algorithms, we can dis use the probabilistic model to select where we're going to be unsound. Uh, with respect to some, or be less precise with respect to some analysis property. Um, we can use the algorithms and the probabilistic model to design experiments about how people understand code. Um, I refer you to our cognitive science papers from last year and stay tuned for more. And there are many others. I refer you to our ICSI near paper from last year where we sort of laid out this modality vision. Okay, so first I'll talk about this, uh, this bit, which is creating training data using bimodality. So let me first introduce the problem. Um, so the problem here is we have some code with some obvious errors, missing close parentheses, some extra weird ellipses. So the idea would be that we want to take this code and parse it and actually do typing. So in the end, we had left with an AST with type annotations, right? All the syntax errors fixed, parsed, and typed. So why would we want to do this, right? So both beginners, uh, you know, and Stack Overflow are abundant sources of this kind of code. Beginners would like help in fixing pesky syntax errors. And, you know, we'd like to directly copy paste code from Stack Overflow and let the IDE do its thing, All right? So we have a video demo of this stuff. I refer you to the QR code if you want to see um, how this actually works um, So how, in practice in, in a Visual Studio plugin, right? So. OK, we already have parsers. These parsers can parse correct source code all day long. Uh, and this is what we call the formal algorithmic channel, right? So what we can do is that we can run this all day long and produce pairs, right? Align pairs of code and ASDs. And then because a natural channel exists, we can use a learner to learn to do this, right? So. This is all possible because of the natural channel, because code is so predictable and is written in predictable ways um, and produce predictable ASTs, we can actually train a machine learner to do this. Now, why would I want to do this? We already have really good algorithms to parse code, right? OK, well, so what we can do, in fact, is to put a noiser on the source code. So we feed the source code, we feed, we generate pairs consisting of erroneous and what the AST should be if the source code wasn't erroneous. So we can produce these pairs. And again, because of naturalness and the capacity of machine learning models, we can learn a lenient parser that can actually fix errors and still produce the correct parse and the correct type. OK, so that's the idea here. Um, and so this is where we use the formal channel to produce training data, and we use the natural channel, um, and the, the, the affordances of a natural channel to learn a probabilistic model. So in practice, it's a little more complicated. You know, we want to go from bad source code to fixed source code. We actually use two learned models. 
one to fix indentations and nesting structures, and the other to fix errors within the lines of code. We call them block fix and frag fix. OK, block fixes task is essentially to fix nesting. Both are trained using the same kind of bimodal scheme that I discussed earlier. Um, and then once the, the block fix fixes errors uh, in nesting, we send it through a segmenter, which splits it according to the nesting and finds spans of lines of code and fragments. These fragments often have errors in them in turn. So then we take these erroneous fragments, fix them using a learned model frag fix, and then we combine these fixed uh, fragments into uh, the complete source code using the spans that we found earlier. OK, so uh, so all this works. Um, uh, uh, it's, you know, and all this was trained bimodally um, using noise depth source code, uh, uh, using various kinds of noise and the corresponding correct uh, ASDs and types. Um, so uh, we have a few iterations of this, and at the moment it works quite well. And we have a, um, a Visual Studio plugin that you can you can get. So how does this perform? So um, so first for Stack Overflow. Um, so what you can do is you can grab fragments from Stack Overflow, wrap them inside a dummy method, and send it to a normal parser that is an algorithmic parser. And this works pretty well. It parses about seventy percent. Um, of 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 uh, Stack Overflow fragments, and we can push it up to ninety percent um, uh, because uh, you know our, our 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 fragment is better at fixing errors in the code and associating types. Turning to types, um, bad ideas have a tough time typing erroneous code from Stack Overflow. Uh, we do pretty well, so I've broken down the performance by different categories: Android, Core Java, and most popular. Um, Java APIs. So for Android, we get a median accuracy for typing for around 50% with respect to the correct types. Um, uh, with respect to core Java, we do around 80% or above. And for popular APIs, we have a median of around 90 something percent. OK, so, um, so this does pretty well. Student code, there's a large data set of student code from, uh, from the UK called BlueJay. Um, so our latest iteration fixes about 75% of single token errors in this data set. That is top one accuracy. Um, so the performance you know, does degrade with length. Um, so as we use longer and longer code fragments, you know, we do see a degradation in performance. So on the x-axis, we have the length up to 100 tokens, up to 200 tokens, and so on, all the way up to 1,000 tokens. So uh, for shorter code fragments, we get pretty high performance in the 80% range. And for the very longest code fragments, performance drops to around 55%. So again, this is for single token errors. Um, fixing multiple token errors is much harder. Um, so for two token errors, we get a performance of around 30% accuracy, top one. And for three token errors, we get around 15% accuracy. Um, and um, so, so you know, this is this is our current tool. Um, so again, to to emphasize, this is all because of bimodal training, um, where we use um, algorithms to produce noisy code ASD pairs, and then we use the probabilistic modeling to learn how to fix these errors. So this is what we call our linear parser. Um, I refer you to the QR code if you want to see a demo. Uh, the source code of this Visual Studio plugin that is being demoed is also available. Uh, please contact us if you'd like to. If you're somebody in Visual Studio and wants to incorporate this, please get in touch with us. We'd love it. OK. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, that's bimodal training. Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, it's I have to end this talk with some thank yous. Um, so, uh, I was raised in a Tamil Christian family, and I used to hear this all the time when I was growing up. To be alive is to be grateful. The actual way it's said is a little harsher than that, but anyway, that's a good translation. So, in that spirit, I'd like to speak to a few things that I'm thankful for. So um, I'm thankful, first of all, for a field full of smart, kind, and welcoming people. Um, I'm grateful for a whole lot of great collaborators, uh, faculty, postdoc students over the last 30 years that I've been doing research. I'm grateful for my job. I don't have a boss. And if someone thinks they're my boss, I can pretty much ignore him. Um, I get to hang around really interesting people, 
I get to pick what I want to investigate, so I'm most grateful for that. So the citation for this award explicitly mentions the naturalist work. This work just would not have happened without some brilliant and lovely colleagues who were at UC Davis at the time. Abraham Hindle, who's now faculty at Alberta, or El Bar, now faculty at UCL, and last but not least, her doctor, Professor Jindong Su, now at the Eidgenossische Technische Hochschule in Zurich, Switzerland. So I'm really grateful to these guys, and um, I'm really honored to have had the opportunity to work with them. So naturalists at UC Davis, uh, you know, a whole uh, lot of really talented, wonderful, great people, wonderful collaborators, faculty, students, postdocs, undergraduates. Um, and some of them have gone on to do wonderful things, and others are still there and uh, expect great things from them. Right. Um, I'd also like to thank a number of people who were early mentors for me. When I joined the field over 30 years ago, they made me feel welcome and gave me good advice. I'd like to thank Dwayne Perry, Pamela Zave, uh, Alex Wolf, David Rosenblum, Elaine Wayuker, Alex Burgida, my advisor, Dave Notkin, and, uh, and Mary Jean Herald, may they rest in peace, Laurie Dillon, and Vic Basili. So a word that I, something I should say, some of you may notice that most people on this slide are white. Well, yes, that reflects the past. The field has become a lot more diverse in the past 30 years. There's a lot more people of color, a lot more people who are gay and out and transgender and so on. And for that also, I'm very grateful. The faces in the last few slides are a good reflection of the current status of the field, and I'm grateful for that as well. So finally, I'm thankful for my extremely nutty and creative family. This is pretty typical behavior in my house. They're all quite mad, really. So anywhere but Northern California, some of us might be in jail. Finally, I'd like to thank the audience for listening. And I'd, I'd like to leave you with um, the excitement of bimodal hypothesis. So the two channels, the formal channel that enables algorithms, and the natural channel that enables probabilistic modeling, and the excitement that these two lead to great synergies. I'd like you to give you a QR code for this paper in Xenia 2020, where we explore some of these concepts in more detail. And that's it. Thank you. Should I stop sharing? Uh, yeah, maybe stop sharing because some people can see you. Okay. Like I think. Okay. So yeah, so lots of uh, emojis like people showing feel up for your talk. And so we have a few questions from the chat, which I'm going to go through. If you have any questions for Brain, please put them into the chat, and I'm going to ask on your behalf. Um, so the first question I'm going to choose is by by Draw, and he was basically asking, so he's saying, when writing a function's header comment, we want to describe the semantics at a higher level of abstraction than the code. We specifically don't want to describe the code. Uh, doesn't this imply that the translation and analogy is broken to begin with? It may be. Um, so, you know, uh, there, there are other methods uh, besides just, as, uh, you know, simply using translation. Some people have looked at, like, uh, for example, finding some sort of template structure of what comments for methods similar to this one look like, and then using a separate stage to fill in the template. Maybe that's a better idea. It does. The results suggest that that actually may work better. But I agree with you that there is, there is something to this because a good comment doesn't say what's in the code. It says something that's not obvious from the code. So how do you actually provide that? And is that relationship a probabilistically modelable one? I don't know. It remains to be seen. And then there were a few questions around uh, the blue measurement. Uh, so one is one of the questions is if um, it's by Giovanni, and it is isn't the difference in distribution of NL and code slash comment due to the fact that blue blue is a synthetic measurement? The data might be well behaved but the metric might not get this behavior. Uh, could you repeat that last part? I'm not sure I understand. 
So the, the second part of the uh, question is basically the data might be well behaved, but the metric might not get this behavior. So I think I take the question to mean that syntactic similarity doesn't necessarily mean semantic similarity. Um, well, I mean, you're talking as you be talking about code um, in because you know this case blue was being used to measure similarity between English utterances, and uh, you know the, blue has some critics. That's why people have invented other metrics like rogue. Um, but in by and large, it seems like higher blue leads to higher rating, higher rated translations by human beings. So. You know, uh, starting with the original paper, it seems to suggest that if you get higher blue, people think it's a better translation. You know, higher blue compared to the golden output. Okay. The, the next question by Mikhail is somewhat related. Um, is it possible that blue is just a bad metric for the comment generation task? One can probably argue that comment generation is similar to text generation problem in NLP. And for the text generation, blue has been shown to be poorly correlated for human judgment. Right. So uh, yeah, so this is why people have other metrics like rogue. And you know, so um, you know, in our paper you'll see that the you know we did use rogue as well as to show that you know information retrieval is a surprisingly good baseline. Um, so yeah, I agree with that. So there has been some work showing that there are better metrics in blue. But blue, you know, still seems to be a good thing. If, if higher blue seems to be correlated with people's preference, um, there's been a number of studies on that. So, so I actually had one question about um, evaluation, like how to ev evaluate these approaches in general. Like one, like basically in, in your slides, you were showing um, that you have like training and testing data set, mm -hmm. which corresponds largely to like a more offline validation of your approach. Mm -hmm. But also, can you maybe talk a little bit about like how, like once you deploy a tool, like what would be good strategies to evaluate the effectiveness of the tools that you build? Yeah, so, right. So we've done some human subject evaluations, mostly in terms of how naturalness relates to code comprehension. Um, so I guess it depends on the particular setting. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the golden standard is to have a human being in the loop and design some study which is task oriented. So you're kind of measuring whether the the particular tool actually helps with the task. Um, sometimes you can do that. Sometimes it's difficult to do that. So these sort of quantitative evaluations can be a reasonable proxy. Okay. The next question is by Martin. And uh, it reads, there's a principal problem with naturalness of code. Bad code is widespread and also natural. So when learning from existing code, we also perpetuate our mistakes. Is there a way around this problem? Well, I'm not sure I entirely agree premise that bad code is prevalent, I would say if bad code is less than, you know, I don't know, 1% or 3% of the code, which I think is probably the case for the kind of projects that we sample from, we sample highly starred projects. So in that case, I think the probabilistic model is going to more or less learn, you know, kind of distributions over good code. Um, so, you know, if, if, if this assumption is false, I think that would be a really good um, really good kind of experiment to show. Um, that said, one experiment I'd really love to do is I think that bugs that look natural are harder to find. So I haven't done this experiment, but I'd love to to do this experiment. So if somebody's interested in doing this, you know, uh, please give me a shout. Cool. So while uh, I have one more question, why people are thinking of additional ones, is so if you think about the, the future of the of the field, like the naturalness and the bimodal hypotheses, like if you think like 10 years ahead, like what do you think will be the, what will we have accomplished and what are the big challenges going forward? So in your next 10 year, I see. <laughs> okay, so you asked me a question so I can annoy some people. <laughs> You know, giving these sorts of uh, you know prophetic pronouncements about the future is always dangerous. Um, so my personal opinion is that we're going to build better and better tools uh, to help programmers. 
I'm extremely skeptical of of synthesis working at any large scale. You know, maybe we'll succeed in synthesizing, uh, you know, small SQL queries or small R functions to help people who don't want to bother writing SQL or R. But even in that case, I think it's just assisting them. I mean, you, you know, a human being still has to look at the SQL or R and see that it's going to do the right thing. Otherwise, you know, the machine is going to produce nonsensical you know, from time to time is going to produce nonsensical p-values or nonsensical SQL tables that are not what the user really wanted. So I think better software tools for developers, better and better ones, and maybe helping programmers be more and more efficient. And to a limited extent, you know, helping people learn about coding, because maybe the samples that you get from the thing, you know, calls an API that you didn't know existed or, you know, uses some functions in some ways that, you, that you're surprised by. But... Um, I, I don't think you know. I, I don't think we're gonna have like, you know, uh, uh, Arnold Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator automatic coding engines, you know, which breathe fire and such is not gonna happen. My opinion. So, so that's something. It's gonna be in twenty years, or, or it's never gonna happen. <laughs> uh, well, you know, if we solve the artificial general AI problem, you know, then then maybe it'll happen. <laughs> cool. Um, well. Okay, so the next question uh, is by Andreas, and he is saying we need not necessarily learn from bad code, but repeating good code again and again is another issue we typically address with clone detection. Should we actually repeat code structures? Um, so, uh, you know, it's a really, uh, you know, a good question. I mean, I would say yes, uh, because, um, you know, uh, our at least our preliminary data suggests that if you write code in unusual ways, then it's harder. They tend to make mistakes in comprehension um, so with human subject studies. So I think that idiomatic programming is a good thing. Um, and, you know, if statistical models help you write idiomatic code or help you point out where your code is not idiomatic, I, you know, I think it's a good thing. It makes your code reader happy. So the next question is by Gias, and he is referring to the dual channel process. So for the dual channel process, are we making formal machine learning and inference algorithms more robust by by adding noisy and natural software engineering data uh, in parentheses AI for SE as context? Or if the second choice is basically, or is it that we are creating a new breed of algorithm in SE that combines the strength of the both domains? Say so SE for AI. So I think both? I think the excitement is both, right? So we're sort of using algorithms to gen the example I showed was using algorithms to produce copious amounts of data to train a more robust machine learner, right? Because we have lots, you know, we can train a very high capacity model. If you can create data for free, you know, you can train a model with you know half a billion parameters or something, you know, very powerful models, right? And by the same token, uh, you know, if you're an algorithm that's trying to decide, you know, for example, a static analysis algorithm, should I like do interprocedure analysis at this point, or should I somehow take a summary of this function? Like, should I make some kind of approximation? Um, so at that point, you know, maybe machine learning can help you make good decisions about when you should do approximation and when you shouldn't. Now, um, so you know, I'm hoping that you know at some point I get to uh, static analysis is not my area. So I'm hoping that maybe I could collaborate with somebody who does this kind of work and explore that possibility. Cool. So we have about five minutes left for questions. So if you have any questions, now is your chance to type them into the chat. I also just want to mention that Brame is going to be in the networking event uh, after this keynote. So I think it's a separate event where you have to click to 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 meet with Brame and then you can ask him any type of questions you want that you didn't get to ask now. And it's more like a direct interaction. So uh, also for friends, for colleagues in Asia, there's also another uh, discussion section tonight at 10 p.m. That is my time, 10 p.m. So I'll be there as well uh, for informal discussions uh, yeah. during that time. So Prem is going to be in both. So if you're watching yeah. the recording, don't don't just leave. Uh, <laughs> you still have a chance to meet Prem. So I have one question like you had. You, you were showing all your mentors. And so 
Do you have any advice for incoming new PhD students, like how they should, what they should do to have a similar successful career as you did? Um, I, you know, I, I gave a talk on creativity at the new faculty symposium. Um, I think everybody is different. You know, it's really hard to say what works for whom, right? So, um, you know, I, I got kicked out of the PhD program at Rutgers for a brief time. They put me back in uh, because the, this, the advice I got at the time was that I lacked focus and focus is really important for a PhD student. Well, you know, uh, that was almost 40 years ago and I still lack focus. And that seems to work okay for me, you know. <laughs> it doesn't work for everybody. So it's hard to say. Um, I think, you know, if there's one thing that is probably good for almost everybody, it's finding good colleagues, you know. So, um, you know, if you find somebody that's good to work with, don't let go and stick with them. <laughs> I've made that mistake a few times. I've sort of let collaborations lapse, uh, but don't do that. If you find somebody good to work with, stick with them. Okay, we have one more question um, by Gopi. What does the naturalness of code mean for defect prediction research in general? Um, so it's a, you know we've done some of that. Um, so uh, you know I think essentially it's like you know kind of trying to learn a distribution of the form. You know, is given this code, is it likely to be defective? Right. Um, so maybe it's just how improbable the code is. Um, so if it's improbable, there is probably something wrong with it. Uh, you know, either it's written in a weird way or maybe it's wrong. Um, uh, you know, so th there's there's been other work where like uh, people try to find misuse of variable names. Um, you know, you you meant to say, you know, uh, uh, principal to the power of years or interest rate to the power of years in study right years to the power of interest rates or something like that. Um, so there's been work like that. Um, you know, and you can make use of all sorts, any kind of information you can get about the code. So you could run the code through a parser or a type checker and then try to figure out whether this seems wrong. So you can use information directly in the code, information produced by algorithms, put it all together and then try to figure if there's a mistake. So yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's a good direction. The problem is that getting data about defects is noisy. Uh, it's difficult to do. Right, you know where where the defects are because bug fixes often involve code that's not really defective. You know the commits are tangled and there's a lot of problems. Uh, there's an interesting data set from Google called Stubs, short stupid bugs or something like that. It's from um, Charles Sutton at Google. Um, it's a good data set. Um, it's small bugs, um, but it's also noisy. You got to be careful even with that. But it's it's sort of a good one. Uh, it's a it's a fun, exciting data set to work with. Cool. So so yeah, with this, I want to thank you again for the wonderful keynote, and congratulations on your successful and accomplished career. And we look forward to many many more years of amazing contributions by you and your research group. Thank you so much. OK. So I just leave the room and go to chat. Is that what it is? I, I, think, I think it is a separate event. OK, so you go to researcher and then go from there, I guess, right? Anto Antonia, do you know by any chance? Don't think she's here. No, I don't. Yeah, I am here. Uh, I think you should find the room uh, meet, uh, meet Prem, I think. Yes. Let me see. I paste the link in the chat. OK, live now, seven rooms. So this in plenary room 191 people are here meet, meet, yeah meet. if you go to if you go to happening now there should be networking meet Prem Devanbu and that's where you can meet Prem and talk to him directly okay so thank yeah. you everyone for attending and see you in the Prem networking event and you can also attend the networking event with Prem if you're in the mirrored XC band Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.